Now the second guideline may seem just a little oversimplified, and that is read the Bible. Read the Bible. Someone asked a great Shakespearean scholar years ago, says, how do you study Shakespeare? And his answer was very brief and terse. Read Shakespeare. And I'd say to you, read the Word of God. You want to know what the Bible has to say? Read the Bible. And may I inject this also? We have already suggested to you to listen to the broadcast, to get the notes, and to read the passage under consideration. Let me come back now and say, regardless of whether you get the notes or regardless of whether you hear the broadcast, it's all important to read what the Bible has to say. And it's very important. It is said of Dr. G. Camel Morgan, and he, I think, has written some very wonderful and helpful books on the Bible. He has a series of books called Living Messages of the Books of the Bible. It's on each one of the 66 books of the Bible. When I started out as a student, I know of nothing that had more influence on my study of the Word than these books. Now, it was said of him that he would not put a pen to paper in writing these books until he had read a particular book of the Bible through 50 times. Think of that, my friend. So don't be weary in well-doing. Just read the Word of God. If you don't get it the first time, read it the second time. If you don't get it the second time, read it the third time. And if you don't get it the third time, just keep on reading it. And let me say this, you'll not be wasting your time. You and I are to get the facts of the Word of God. And what you and I can dig out for ourselves, I don't think the Spirit of God is going to reveal to us. I just don't believe that. I think that the Bible is a divine book. But remember, I also said it's a human book. And if you are going to learn certain things about the Bible, you will just have to, if you please, you're just going to have to study those things. You're going to have to read. You're going to have to read the Bible and read it sometimes again and again. Here's a very interesting statement that I've lifted out of Nehemiah. It's back in Nehemiah 8, the first three verses. And it's that great Bible reading that took place when they put up a pulpit before the water gate and Ezra read there. Let me read this to you. And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both the men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday before the men and the women and those that could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive under the book of the law. And the very interesting thing in this connection is that he put out among the people certain men. They were of the tribe of Levi, and these men went among the people and they explained the Bible. I assume from the way that the count is given that what actually took place was that these men were stationed in certain areas and then Ezra would read a certain portion and then he would stop. And the people that had listened, they would be given an opportunity to ask questions. That is, of these that were stationed out there to explain the Bible to them, you see. And we are told, I'm reading now verse 7 of chapter 8 of Nehemiah, these caused the people to understand the law and the people stood in their place. Now verse 8 is a very important verse. So they read in the book, in the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. May I say to you, I used to teach a group of young theologues, young men studying for the ministry, homiletics, that is, how to preach. And one of the things I told them, learn to read the Bible distinctly and that this was the 
greatest lesson that there is. Read in the book of the law distinctly. I hate to hear anyone get up to read the Bible and they start in like this. You don't know whether it's Chinese or whether it's from Manchuria, that you do not know where it's come from. They don't sound like they're reading English at all. We're to read in the book of God distinctly and to give the sense. Now, that is very simple, you see, but it's very important that God's people understand the Word of God. Therefore, we should read the Bible. Now, they cause the people to understand, and we need to read the Bible. And there's so many distractions today from the study of the Word of God. I suppose the greatest distractor that we have is the church. The church today is made up of committees and organizations and banquets and entertainments and promotional schemes to the extent that the Word of God's not even dealt with in many churches today. And many churches have disbanded the preaching service altogether. And I notice that even our cosmopolitan Papers here in Los Angeles have played this up, that certain churches no longer are going to have a preaching service. They're going to have a time in which the people will be able to just express themselves and say what they are thinking. And I can't think of anything that will be more pure, more nonsensical, more waste of time than that. And may I say it's a fine excuse for a lazy preacher who will not read or study the Bible to get out of preaching. And after all, I've always felt that liberalism was wasting their time preaching anyway. They didn't have anything to preach, if you please. And I say that I trust kindly today, but somebody needs to say these things that God says that it's by the foolishness of preaching he's going to save man. And that means preaching and teaching the Word of God. And that was the thing you remember Paul gave us this one song to a young preacher. Preach the Word. It's the Word of God, my friend, that needs to be given out. And I quote Psalm 36, 9. This is a marvelous song. This is a marvelous verse. For with thee is the fountain of light. In thy light shall we see light. You see. And it's by reading the Word of God, which is light. And then, if we don't understand it, the Spirit of God's our teacher to lead us into all truth. So that we have now these two things that are all important. Begin with prayer. Second, read the Bible. Third, study the Bible. And again, let me quote Dr. Morgan. For years ago, someone said to him, you speak as though you are inspired. And Dr. Morgan said, inspiration is 95% perspiration. Now may I say to you that the Bible needs to be studied. I had many years ago several hundred students and classes in Bible, and these students were made up of all kinds of young folk, and among them were a few very pious individuals. And I understood these young people very well after a period of time. I must confess, I didn't understand them at first. They acted very pious, but that covered up a tremendous ignorance and vacuum relative to the Word of God. And some of them would not study the night before an exam. They always would give an excuse that they were busy in a prayer meeting somewhere or a service. And I would always be rather hard-boiled with them and say, the Lord sent you here to study the Bible, and that's primary. Someone's paying your tuition. So the thing for you to do is when an exam is coming up on the morrow, that you will know it's not the Lord's will for you to spend the night in prayer. Do it the night afterward, but not the night before, because he wants you to study the Bible. And I had a feeling that we had some that felt like they could sort of put the Bible underneath their pillow, and that during the night as they slept, that there would come up through the duck feathers the names of the kings of Israel and Judah. But I used to tell them, it won't come up through the duck feathers, and it won't come up by you ducking it either. You're going to have to knuckle down and study the Word of God. 
one fellow I never shall forget in a Bible class when I was in college. He said, Doctor, you've given us a section that's very dry. And the professor, without even missing a step, he said to him, Then dampen it a little with sweat from your brow. May I say to you that the Bible should be studied. And it's very important that we see that and that we remember that there is certain knowledge that the Spirit of God's not going to give to you. I do not think that he's revealing truth to lazy people. If you read the Bible and don't understand and then study the Bible, and that it must be studied. After all, you must put it in a category with any other book. You'd never learn logarithms or geometry. You can't learn Greek by just reading a chapter in it right before you go to sleep at night. By the way, you may be shocked when I say what I'm going to say about devotional reading of the Bible, our devotional reading. And may I say that I do not encourage that type of reading at all because I've learned over a period of years that a great many people who are very faithful at what they call devotional reading are very much ignorant of the Bible. To begin with, devotional reading is generally done at a time in which it ought not to be done. I stayed with a family for over a week when I was holding meetings in a place in Middle Tennessee, and every morning at the breakfast table, we had devotion. And unfortunately, breakfast was always a little late, and Susie and Willie were rushing to get away to school, and I'm confident they didn't even know what was read. And Dad was wanting to get away to work, and he generally made it a very brief reading, and always he'd say, well, I'll read this familiar passage this morning, because we don't have much time. And believe me, we didn't. By the time that the reading was over, these two children, they went away from the table like they were shot out of a gun, and he got out of there almost as quickly as they did, and Mother was left with the dishes, and I wondered whether she had really heard whether anything would be read. I determined right there and then in my own, we wouldn't have devotional reading. I've always tried to encourage the members of my family to read the Bible on their own. That's the only kind that is profitable. When I was brought up, that's not the way that we studied mathematics. My dad didn't get the family around in the morning at the breakfast table and say, now we're going to have some devotional reading in mathematics. And then he'd take up the lesson that we had for the day. I give you my word, I don't think we'd have learned much in the way of mathematics. And I don't think you learn history that way. Now, somebody's going to say, but I have my devotions at night after the day is over. Well, now, really, don't you have it right before you go to bed? You've got one foot in bed already. One eye is already closed. And again, you turn to a passage of Scripture and you read it. I've made a point never to read the Bible at that time of night. Now, I wake up sometime at night, have difficulty getting back to sleep, and I read the Bible, and I find out, friends, it'll put you to sleep, and if it won't, one of my books will. But may I say to you, I don't think it ought to be read at times like that. I think that you ought to read it when you have time, when you can give time to it. And if you can't give time, you ought to make time, and you ought to set apart 30 minutes or an hour, and if you do things haphazardly like I do, then you will find out that one day you're going to read 30 minutes, the next day five minutes, and the next day two or three hours. I find out that's the best way to do it, that is to fit into my program. And I'd put down no particular rule, but I think each person ought to read it for themselves. I think that that is the thing to do to encourage boys and girls, to read the Bible. And I was delighted to find out when my daughter went away to college and she got pretty far away from us and from other things, but I was told by a roommate 
that she got her Bible out and read it because that's the way we had done it in the home. I believe that is true. Now, I know that's going to shock some folk and say, oh, I think we ought to have our devotional reading together. Well, fine, if that's the way the Lord leads you to do it, you do it that way. But I'll guarantee you, you won't be an intelligent Bible student after 20 years by doing it like that. You have to study the Word of God. The Bible must be studied and intelligently. You remember that Ethiopian eunuch? He was reading the Scripture, and he didn't know what he was reading. And the Spirit of God got Philip to go down and join himself to the Ethiopian eunuch, and then he asked him, do you understand what you are reading? And the man was very honest. After all, he was the treasurer, and he was an honest man. And he said what I think a great many people ought to say today. Well, how can I? I need somebody to help me here. I don't know what he's talking about. Is Isaiah talking about himself or some other? I feel that there must be this study of the Word of God or there'll be no understanding of it. Now, I have been deeply gratified to find that across this country and in other places, literally hundreds of Bible classes have been organized in homes where people can study the Bible, and many pastors have put in this Through the Bible program. They themselves have found it's been a blessing to them, and they have put it into their churches and asked people to study the Bible. That is very important. It was said of John Wesley that he was a man of one book. Well, then what made him a man of one book? Well, I'll tell you what made him a man of one book. He got up and read the Bible at 4 and 5 o'clock every morning. I'm told that he read the Bible in five different languages. Believe me, he studied the Word of God. And you and I today need to study the Word. We need to get the meaning of the Bible. And that's very important. 